everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Empty Nesters book discussion for the month of February. Uh, actually, these are kind of bi-monthly, but we're so happy to be able to see one another and certainly to have the opportunity for an engaging conversation. And, uh, and certainly for those who read um, the book, The Last Mona Lisa, uh, I, I know many of you reached out to say how much you enjoyed it. And I, I'm really excited about the opportunity we have today. So before we, we get started, a few housekeeping items. One reminder to remain muted. Two is we, um, we are really grateful to the Jewish Book Council who uh, made this partnership and this connection possible. And um, as a reminder as well, part of this is uh, we have this opportunity to be together. And if you have not already read the book, um, I'm going to put in the chat a um, link. Oh, hopefully this is the correct link. If it's not, nope, I will get, get it later. I'll put it back in there. Let's see if this is the right link. Um, this is a link to purchase the book through our WHC Mitzvah Mall. That is not the correct link, but hopefully this one is. Yes, uh, someone can check that. Um, but we hope that you'll take the opportunity to um, certainly to, uh, to purchase the book. You can also certainly purchase it at a local bookstore. I know my, my cousin Deborah's on here and she is making it her mission in 2022 to visit 22 uh, local books bookshops, and uh, we know we want to support local local bookshops as well. So I encourage you to to whichever way to um, to purchase the book and uh, and read it if you have not already. Uh, and I'm so so excited today to welcome our author uh, Jonathan Santlofer. I am so thrilled to welcome Jonathan Santlofer to our Empty Nesters book discussion today as we talk about the Last Mona Lisa. Uh, Jonathan Santlofer is the author of seven novels, among them the international bestseller, The Death Artist, and the Nero award-winning Anatomy of Fear. His current novel, The Last Mona Lisa, was a People Magazine Best Books of Summer 2021, a Today Show Pick of the Week, and received starred reviews in Publishers Weekly and Kirkus, and is so far, at least as when this was written, being translated into eight languages, possibly more now, he'll let us know. His best-selling memoir, The Widower's Notebook, appeared on over a dozen best books of 2018 lists, was a featured segment on Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and has been called The Year of Magical Thinking from a Male Perspective. Santlofer is the editor of seven anthologies, including the New York Times notable book, It Occurs to Me That I Am America. His short stories have appeared in numerous anthologies and collections, including the forthcoming Mystery Writers of American Crime Hit, Hits Home. Also an artist, Santlofer's work is in major private and public collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, and Tokyo's Institute of Contemporary Art. He is a recipient of two National Endowment for Arts grants, has been a visiting artist at the American Academy in Rome, the Vermont Studio Center, and serves on the board of Yaddo, the oldest arts community in the US. He lives in New York City where he is currently at work which we're so excited about on a sequel to The Last Mona Lisa, which is so exciting. And perhaps even more importantly, in some ways, in um, six or seven, seven weeks ago, uh, he became a grandfather for the first time. So a mazel tov, most importantly for that work of art. Uh, and which, while not having a hand in creating that work of art, just being able to be a part of that, uh, that beautiful baby's life. What a gift and what a blessing. What a gift for all of us to have you here with us today. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. What a beautiful introduction. I didn't expect the uh, the grandfather part, but <laughs> kind of, it is kind of the very best part, you know. I mean, I'm. I'll, I'll tell you, my days right now are are divided between working on this sequel, and then the minute I stop, I just run over to my daughter's apartment and uh, I tell the parents to go to sleep. <laughs> and I, they, you know, it's funny because he keeps them awake. He's totally wonderful with me. So he gets that I'm not nervous about it, you know? I'm <laughs> yeah, it's really quite, quite something. Quite oh. extraordinary. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah. Um, the, the last Mona Lisa, ask your questions, Rabbi, and I would be happy to Thank answer. Thank you. And, and just a reminder to everyone to, if you have questions you would like me to, um, to share, uh, please feel free to send those directly to me in the chat. If you just go to the chat, 
box at the bottom and you click where it says everyone instead of everyone, you can just uh, look for my name and uh, and we'll we'll add those into the conversation. But I, you know, I think first and foremost, um, it's, this is not your first book, uh, but but what led you to this topic? How, how did you come to this book? Um, I think probably in the most obvious way, which is that I found out about the, the actual theft of the Mona Lisa. It really was stolen off the wall of the Louvre Museum in 1911. And to be honest, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, um, um, I don't tell this to everyone, but I started this book 11 years ago because that's when I found out more about this theft and I started researching it. And it was so incredible to me that somebody actually took the Mona Lisa off the wall and walked out of the museum, you know, that I, my mind percolated around that. And I wrote a hundred pages. I gave them to my agent who was very excited and then a bunch of things happened and other things happened in my life, good things and not such good things. And I put the book away. And then um, about three years ago, I took the book out again and I started working on it um, in a more serious way, figuring out how I could blend fact and fiction, the past and the present um, and all of those things coming together, how I would actually write the book. But I will say that in terms of reality, the, the amazing thing is, so this man, Vincenzo Perugia, who was a disgruntled Louvre employee, a carpenter, he was fired, which you learn very soon in my book. Um, he was fired and he hid in a kind of broom closet overnight, came out in the morning um, on a day the museum was closed to the public, which he knew. He was wearing his Louvre employee tunic in case anybody was around. There should have been workers there. Nobody saw him. He walked into the gallery with the Mona Lisa. He took it off the wall. He went into a uh, stairwell, took the frame off and the glass off, which he knew how to do because he was the man who had actually made those for the painting. And then he slipped the panel under his tunic and he walked out of the museum. Amazing, right? But I'll tell you, to me, the more amazing thing is that nobody in the museum missed the painting for two days. People assumed, oh, it must be off being cleaned, which is crazy because they never clean the Mona Lisa. It's too fragile. Um, all these sorts of things. They didn't discover it for two days. Um, to give you an idea that the Mona Lisa was not as important then as it is now, so um, more people came to see the blank wall at the Louvre Museum where the painting had hung than had ever come to see the painting. So it became this sort of cause celeb, you know, and, and then it was gone for two years. There was all kinds of speculation when it was finally, when they finally got it back, it toured um, Italy and then it toured Europe. It came back to Paris. And by then it was like this famous stolen painting. I mean, there's many other reasons we can talk about why this tiny little Leonardo painting has become so famous, but that's what inspired me, this real life theft, you know, and how I could turn that into what I hoped was a really thrilling novel. I mean, that was my aim and you know, Rabbi, when you start, when you start anything, any project, certainly for me, there's that getting acquainted period, I think, you know, where you're kind of reading things and looking at things and, you know, exploring something, maybe when you're writing something for that you're going to be delivering at the temple and you have a specific thought and you think about it for a while and you make notes about it, right? And, and then it develops and you can see for me, I start to see if it's something or not, you know? And there have been many books that I didn't follow through on. I have this big file on my computer. It, it used to be books that I had started, I intended to finish. Now I retitled it not long ago and it's called Books I Will Never Write. So it's like 20 pages or 40 pages or 60 pages of a book that I will never write. Um, but the last Mona Lisa really caught fire for me in the last few years for many, many reasons. And um, I just wrote it in a kind of fury, you know? Uh, and it's, um, 
So to me, you know, it's a book that's very dear to my heart because I was happy with it. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a difficult book, like all of these things are difficult, but my, I hoped that in the end, it would be a very easy book for the reader because I feel like that's my job. You know, my job is not for anybody to look at the book and think, gosh, that guy worked very hard. I don't, I don't want that. I don't want any reader thinking about me at all. I want them in the adventure and turning pages. And, you know, the best, best compliment I can get is when somebody says, you know, I read your book in two days. And I think, yeah, I only worked on it for, you know, three years, but, but I'm <laughs> thrilled when I hear that, you know, it's, it's wonderful. So that was kind of the beginning for me. And I, and I think I shared that with you when we, when we spoke in preparation for today, uh, that, you know, it was one of those, I sat down to read it and it was, it was like a, a two days, it's engaging and, um, and exactly you were successful in your, in your goal of what you want the, the reader experience to be. And, and I'm saying that not just from my own experience, but others have, have shared that with me. Uh, and, uh, and, and because there's so much uh, attention and so, so much fascination with the Mona Lisa, which is why it's so interesting that it was not necessarily this big deal painting before um did you go i mean I'm, I'm sure you've seen it um but in preparation for at some point obviously pre-covid um what did you go to 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 visit the mona lisa did luckily pre-covid i did all of my travel research um mm -hmm. so i was in you know you can imagine rabbi it's quite a quite a hardship to have to go to Paris <laughs> to go to Florence, right? Um, I, I did, and I, I got to see the Mona Lisa the way Luke Perone in the book gets to see it. I got to see it alone with two guards on either side of me who felt like they were going to pounce on me any minute, <laughs> even though the painting is, you know, behind bulletproof glass. Um, you know, it, it's interesting if you think about why things become important in the world, it's because something, other things are attached to them, you know, other spiritual things, other people, other history. So the Mona Lisa is one of Leonardo da Vinci's 15 or 16 oil paintings. That's all he did. You know, we think about him as this wildly prolific artist, but that's not, and he was with his notebooks, his drawings, his uh, architecture, architectural sketches, his, um, you know, uh, circulatory drawings, his inventions. But when it came to oil paintings, uh, he was a bit of a slacker, you know, he only, he only painted 15 or 16 paintings. And so because he's one of the masters of the high Renaissance, it's, let's see, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, Titian, and Giorgione, Although I would add some other artists who've been left out. There's a lot of, you know, Artemisia Gentileschi, who's in my book, you know, uh, one of the great, great Renaissance painters and a woman who was kind of left out of art history until more recently. And she's as good as any of them. But anyhow, I put her in the book when they go to the Uffizi Gallery. Um, I have Luke and Alex spend a little time with an Artemisia Gentileschi, but if, so you have one, the Mona Lisa is one of 15 or 16 paintings. It's connected to the high Renaissance. Um, the painting was a commission of a silk merchant's third wife, Lisa Giardini. She was very young. Um, Leonardo took the commission when he needed the money, then he didn't need the money and he never gave them the painting. Kept the painting with him his entire life I, I always wondered, did they give him a deposit? Did he give it back? Did they not pay him? I don't know. Anyhow, he kept the painting. It was with him when he died. He was living in France. And when he died, the painting went into the French courts. And then um, Napoleon came along and stole it and put it on his bedroom, went, bedroom wall. So it has some stories to tell. And then it ended up in the Louvre Museum and then it was stolen. Um, you know, so it has this amazing history that is attached to this one very little, very lovely little painting. Um, there are other paintings, of course, that are more spectacular, but don't have that history attached to them. So I, I think that's a big part of it, you know. Um, and thank you for your kind words a minute ago. I'm, I'm glad you it read so quickly and, and fun, you know. Yep. 
which is why I'm so excited that you're working on a, on a sequel. Um, but certainly, I think part of perhaps why it is, uh, I mean, you really take us into that the world of the artist, which you know well. Um, so will you share a little bit with us about uh, your background? Um, I know you have an MFA and tell us a little bit about your, because you also write, this is sort of a bringing together of your passions of, uh, you, you write crime stories, um, novels, and and certainly art and, and bringing this together. And I don't know uh, how many of your other books also weave together those, those passions. Um, some do, the first one, The Death Artist does. And my favorite of my books before the last Mona Lisa is a book called Anatomy of Fear. And the reason I love that book is I created a character, um, Nate Rodriguez. I wanted him to represent New York City. So I made him half Jewish and half Puerto Rican. And the, I'll just tell you, I digress for a moment. Oh, let me say, the reason I created it is he's a police sketch artist. And so I got to put my drawings, my sketches in the book. That was my, but I love that book. And, and you, you know, uh, I based part of that character on a friend of mine who is Puerto Rican and his abuela, his grandmother, who, it, was just so much like my Jewish grandmothers. You know, I'd come in, I'm kind of a skinny guy. She would be like, you, you have to eat, you know? It was like that, which is what my grandmothers were always doing for me, you know, feeding me. And I just thought it's so interesting that ethnic grandmothers seem to share this so many qualities. Um, but so my art background is that, you know, I came from, and it, it, it's, Kind of my Jewish background. Um, my father was from Queens and my mother uh, was from the Bronx. They were both first generation. Um, my mother, you know, for, from European Jews. And they, my mother's family was very poor. My father's family was a little less poor. And they worked very hard in that way that I think a lot of first generation Jewish families did to do everything for their children and to make sure we were educated. I mean, it's so interesting to me that these two kids, I refer to my mother and father, who came from really difficult backgrounds, but wonderful backgrounds, um, really encouraged in us, you know, this love of reading, this love of art, of thought, of intellect. And um, they really, you know, when I, <laughs> I wasn't really good at much else, at least I didn't think so, except for art. And so I was gonna go to art school and, and you know, it was a big thing for, you know, middle-class boy to be going to art school, but my parents supported me, you know, and, and they, I remember my father, when I really finally admitted what I wanted to do, he said, okay, Johnny, but you just better be the best artist possible. And I said, I'll, do, I'll try my best, dad. Uh, and, you know, so anyhow, I became a rather serious artist and I was for a long time participating in the ongoing art world. And, and it was my dream, you know, and I sort of made it happen. And then, as life has it, you know, we, we always think we're controlling life, but we don't. Uh, this goes back to 1990. Um, my gallery organized a retrospective exhibition that they brought together 10 years of my work, borrowing paintings from museums and galleries and collectors. Plus I added my like four to I think six new paintings. And the painting went to this little museum in Chicago and it opened on a Friday and the building burned down to the ground on Saturday. And it changed my life. Now, that's 30 years ago. So I can look back at that and I can say to you, nobody died. It was just stuff. Um, and I believe that with all my heart. At the time, it was a little more difficult to say that, you know. But also, as I said, life is very unpredictable. And, and that happened, it was in April. And about a week after that, the American Academy in Rome got in touch with me to come the following year as their visiting visual artist for the year. And so in the fall, I packed up, you know, my wife and I and our nine-year-old daughter went to, went to live, eight-year-old daughter went to live in Rome, which 
I have to say, if you're going to be depressed, Rome is a pretty great place to be depressed, you know. Um, and there I started making copies and drawings from going to museums and going to see actual art I'd never seen. But I also started a novel. And uh, that I had been writing for the art magazines as a cultural reporter, but that was my first serious idea about writing. And I did it because I was very lost in my artwork. And if you were to ask me 20 years ago, I would have said, well, I'm an artist who writes. I would say very much now I'm a writer who paints. I draw every day, but it's more for myself. I've withdrawn from that very serious art world. I mean, my work still exists in museums and that's nice, uh, but I, I spend more of my time writing. So that's how it all sort of happened, you know. So a, uh, a question uh, from one of our listeners is, um, uh, on this question of art, and uh, someone is curious uh, with your art background, why there's nothing on the walls, at least behind you. <laughs> well, that's a good question, because during the first quarantine, when I was, I lived in, a, this is a big loft. I mean, it goes on, it's like 3,000 square feet, wow. and the back half is my studio, but I had the place painted during quarantine. And I took everything down and I've not <laughs> put it back up. And you know, it's very funny, but I, I kind of like that the front, my living space is very quiet and empty. And when I go in the back and I would have probably zoomed from there, but my reception isn't good because they just built a building that blocks my view of the Empire State Building where I got great reception, but that's New York. Nothing is sacred, you know? Um, and so I'll, I have a lot of art on the walls and things I work on back there. So I don't know. I may keep my walls empty up here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll be with you, uh, you know, after the, after the sequel comes out, maybe we'll do this again. And we'll, if you have things on the wall by then, and if not, it could be part of the, the process of what, what you need around you. Um, uh, you know, you, you spoke about uh, the, uh, the character, and uh, in, in specifically about the character in Anatomy of Fear, but uh, one of the things that I know is so interesting about uh, The Last Mona Lisa, actually, before I get to this question, yeah. someone also asked about the title itself. You know, we know the book is about the Mona Lisa, but why the last Mona Lisa? Where does that, that last come into play? Um, I'll be perfectly honest with you. We came up with that title and we all just lost it. Uh, I'm right, I'm right. There we go. Okay, good. Now I can speak to you. Oh, oh wait, hold on. I think. Oh, let me That's take okay. care of that. Okay, good. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about uh, that. I I did not have the title while I worked on the book. Um, I had a working title that was called the original, which has a lot to do with the book, with forgeries and originals and what's real and what's not. But nobody, my agent, nobody liked that title. And so I kind of brainstormed with my daughter and other people, and we came up with a bunch of titles. And the last Mona Lisa, to me, it meant sort of like, you know, here are all of these Mona Lisas being forged in the book, copied, and that one of them would be the last one. But I, I loved the sound of it. I just liked the sound of it. And my agent in particular was very um, emphatic that I had to get Mona Lisa into my title because of the iconic status of that painting and I and she was right she was right you know so um yeah now you were asking me something so about. the other the other question and this is something we spoke about a little bit it was about um characters and uh not as much Luke and Alex uh and, and others uh, but but the city of Florence is a character, is a main character in this book, which I loved. You talked about going to Rome uh, and uh, and you know being in in Rome as a sort of a healing balm, perhaps. Uh, and I, I think I I did share with you that I was I had the the really wonderful opportunity uh, and experience of going to Fl well went to Venice and Florence and Rome on our honeymoon, and and actually we extended our stay in Florence because it was 
it was impossible to do everything, to see everything. And we just wanted more and more of, of what Florence had to offer. So will you talk to us about, about the character of Florence? Oh, sure. I think that that's such a great observation that Florence is a character in the book. Um, you know, I had been to Florence a, a few times in my life. And when we lived in Rome, I remember going and I liked it and I'd seen all the important sites, but I didn't feel in love with Florence. And my editor, I had finished the book and not my editor, my, my agent who is also was a great Random House editor and is, edits my books said to me, you know, the book is really great, but I could use just a little more color about Florence. And so I went and my daughter got on my computer and she Airbnb'd an apartment for me in Piazza de Madonna, which is exactly where Luke Perone is in the book. And so I went there and I lived there for about three and a half weeks in a fourth floor walk up in Piazza di Madonna with a roof that overlooked the Duomo it was extraordinary. But, and what I did because I had finished the book is I knew every single route that my characters took in Florence. And so I did all, I would walk about seven or eight miles a day. I would, you know, take notes and pictures about where Alex was and Luke were or Smith was, all these people. Plus I went to see all the monuments again, both, I did it in two ways. I went um, when there were tourists in there and I also had private viewings. Uh, I, I just, you know, I, I feel like if I write about a place, I have to experience it. You know, it has to come alive. You have to know what it smells like and what it feels like to be there. And, and that's what happened to me. So I, you know, I also um, got permission to work in the Laurentian Library in their research room, which is where Luke is every day reading his great grandfather's prison diary. And so I got to be in there. And you'll, you'll know, uh, Rabbi, that the um, head, she wasn't really the head librarian. Um, she was the doorkeeper. For some reason, was not enchanted with me. I don't know what I did to offend her, but uh, she was rather difficult. She would have me frisked practically every day. But this just arrived a few days ago, the Italian version of the book, and I sent her a copy. So she will recognize herself. I wonder if she's going to try and I don't know what. But anyhow, <laughs> um, yeah, Florence to me, you know, what was important is when I came back, I rewrote the entire book with my feelings and my new notes about Florence. But then I had to let it sit for a few days and write again because I didn't want the, it to, I didn't want it to feel like a travelogue. It, you know, when you're writing something, everything has to be there for a reason. And um, so, but I'll tell you one of the great <clears throat> things that happened to me in Florence, which never would have happened had I not gone. Um, a very good friend of mine said, you have to meet my friend, Lorenzo Pezzettini. He's a Florentine artist. And so when I got there, I <clears throat> e emailed Lorenzo and like all friendly Italians, he said, ah, let's have a drink now. And so he came and met me, we had a drink. Turned out he was have, had just had an exhibition in a place called Limerate Contemporanea. And I said, Limerate, isn't that the name of a prison? He said, yes, this little contemporary art thing is a little section of it, but, and the prison's a monument. He said, it's closed. And I said, I have to get in. You have to get me into the prison. So he called the director of the Contemporary Arts Center and the very next day, she had gotten me permission to go into the jail, which was closed. I, I, I had this young guide, so this young man, Stefano, who opened these chains. And I walked, you know, it was like walking into the past and walking through these corridors. And this is exactly the prison where the thief who stole the Mona Lisa, Lorenzo, uh, Lorenzo, <laughs> Vincenzo was imprisoned. And so I got them to actually lock me into a prison cell and stayed in there for about 20 minutes. And I walked back and forth and it ends up being a scene in the book, which I never could have written had I not been there. So that was amazing to me. And I got, you know, spending time in the Medici chapel by myself, understanding that it's a meditation on life and death, um, which, 
is, you know, kind of a beautiful thing that Michelangelo did. So all of those things, I think, I had to find ways, of course, or there, there, there had to be reasons why Luke or another character was interested in seeing those things. Um, and, um, but I, I will say that I get a lot of emails from people who thank me for taking them to Florence and Paris during quarantine. And I'm happy I can, I can do that uh, for my, my new book that I'm working on. Um, I was supposed to go to Amsterdam in January but since everything was closed, I'm going in April. Um, and that's gonna form the last third of my book. And there are things I have to see, including the Anne Frank house, because my, I'm not gonna tell you too much, but I will say that um, the, the sequel has a tremendous Jewish theme in it uh, that has to do with the Nazis. And um, it's still a big advantage but I, I have to, uh, my research is practically killing me. You know, it's mm -hmm. horrifying. Um, and yet, I, I mean, I it really, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you, it has to do with Nazi looted art ultimately in the book. And everybody will forget that by the time the book comes out, we hope, but then you'll see it again. Um, you know, what, particularly, you know, how the Nazis, you know, made lists of Jewish art collectors. I mean, it's, it's quite extraordinary and horrifying what they did. And, you know, how Jews had no ownership and, uh, and how that work became dispersed. So, you know, again, I took one painting and it becomes the adventure that they are looking for in the book, it's very, it, you know, you don't really know a lot of uh, the things that are revealed later, but um, anyway, going back to that. So I hadn't been to, I haven't been to Amsterdam since I was 14 years old. So it's been a while. So I <laughs> have to go and, um, and, and feel what that city is like, you know, and I'll also go to Paris because part of the book takes place in Paris. And luckily I have some friends in Paris. So that's nice too, you know. We, we've been discussing an empty nesters trip. I mean, I think we're broadening where in the world we might go because because of the books we've read together during the pandemic and Paris certainly has been one of them and, and now Florence and, and perhaps Amsterdam will get added to the list. We might have to make it a, a, a European tour. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I just, because I'm speaking to congregation, it, it strikes me that one of the things I just found in my research so a big or a small or whatever part, I'm not totally sure yet of my book, which takes place and has to do with the occupation of Paris. Um, what's so interesting is a lot of the rich Jews, the French Jews had, not that they denied their Jewishness, but they had become so assimilated and they were not really in touch with their Jewishness at all. And so it becomes this horrifying, horrifying irony that here are these people who have almost lost their Jewish identity and they are murdered for it, mm. you know? I mean, it just, you know, it's just such a, um, I don't know. I'm still digesting that, you know, as I write yeah. about it, you know? Um, um, it just as an aside, a, um, I, I took a, a class in rabbinical school uh, on restitution and specifically art, but um, there's a, uh, it was part of a, uh, a, a real focus of one of our professors, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Cohen, who I don't know if you know, he's not, he's no longer teaching at Hebrew Union College, he's in a, a congregation, but I'm happy to connect you because there may be more information that, that he may be able to also share that, not that you necessarily want more research, but oh, he's done a tremendous amount in the field of restitution and Jewish law. And it's, it's become more and more relevant because uh, it's still an ongoing, you know, for so many governments and countries and individual families, this question of restitution continues. And they, you know, um, they discover these things all the time, you know, just, mm -hmm. I don't know how long, it was very recent that they discovered um, Gerlitz, who was, uh, was a, a, a art dealer who collaborated with the Nazis, his son 
they just found his son's apartment, which had 170 looted paintings in it. That's recent, that's in the last few months. So mm -hmm. it is very much ongoing, you know. Um, there's many things that have still not been found. Um, and you know, I'll tell you, Rabbi, it's so wild because I didn't know that what my book was gonna be about. I really didn't. I had this other idea and it just crept in and oh, it kind of just took me over, you know? Mm. So um, I had to contact my editor a couple of weeks ago to say, well, I'm taking out a big part of the book. <laughs> I've moved in this direction. And she said, fine, absolutely fine. Mm. Um, you know, uh, I think that's true with for me with my work. With this last Mona Lisa took me places I did not imagine. And I mean, in my mind, and I'm not someone who outlines my books. And I, I sort of outline them as I go along. And, and I have this feeling, and I did this with my paintings, which are always quite organic. I feel like for the reader or the viewer, they get to discover things along with me. So the discoveries I make in my writing, of course, they get rewritten 20 times, but I do discover a lot on the page, you know, and that to me is exciting um, to sort of have that excitement inside the book, you know. That's great. Um, uh, you know, we taught you talked a little bit about as you're writing this this current book, sort of the the unfolding of that and how how difficult and challenging in so many ways. And uh, I was wondering if you could share a little bit for us. Um, not all your books have that the Jewish uh, topic or focus, but um, but how much of your Jewish lens lends itself, or is uh, do how much do you use that when you're in the process of writing? and researching? Well, you know, the Jewish lens is not a subject. It's not a subject. It's who I am. Do you know, do you know what I mean? I see the world. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so I, my, I was born in New York City. My parents moved out to Long Island just before I was bar mitzvah, when I was 12. And there were almost, nobody no, realizes this, but there were almost no Jews when my parents moved there. My father was one of six men who built the Jewish center, helped build, you know, create it. And I was one of the first bar mitzvahs there. And uh, there was a lot of, I felt a lot of um, anti-Semitism. So I grew up with that. I, so for me, a subject of a book doesn't have to be a Jewish subject for the way I write and the way I feel. You know, for example, in the last Mona Lisa, one of the things, though Luke Perone and, and Smith are not Jews, they are both these men from difficult backgrounds who have an, an antipathy for one another and who have to work together. And my feeling was they had to develop an empathy for one another. And I believe that this is the most essential thing for the world that if we do not have empathy for others, we're in big trouble and we see that every day. And I do believe that that is something my family gave me, you know? I mean, my mother, for sure, my mother was one of six children and an extraordinarily wonderful family. And uh, I think I said to you earlier that, do you hear all the sirens coming? Yeah, I mean, I have, double glazed, huge, but I have 18 windows, so you can't keep the sirens out. Um, and I also have a fire station a block away, so they're always going by. But my grandfather, my mother's father, who I adored and who brought me up in many ways, was um, just an extraordinary man, you know, who I would stay there for, you know, a couple of weeks. And, you know, my, you know, they would always be taking in all of the kids in the neighborhood and feeding them you know they were completely colorblind religion blind and i think i was very fortunate to have gotten that in my life um you know so you know it's in, nowadays people don't want you to write stories that are not your story there's a lot of talk about that so for example i i would it would not be encouraged for me to write the story of a black person or you know but you know, I'm, I'm, I kind of feel like it's important for us to write other people's stories to understand them. But on the other hand, you know, as I'm writing this new book, I think, well, this is my story, 
you know, this is my story. My, my father's mother, whose story can be heard at Ellis Island, talked about how part of her family died at Auschwitz, which is something nobody in the family ever talked about. I discovered it when I went to hear her, her tapes at Ellis Island. I was completely knocked out. And then I went back and talked to my grandmother about it. It's actually a book I'd like to write. I'd like to write it as a nonfiction book and go back and trace as her grandson, how she came to the United States, how she went back, rescued her mother and sister, came back to the, I mean, she did these as a young woman. I don't know how she did it, you know, really amazing. Um, but, you know, I think, so those things formed who I am, you know. Um, in, in, in The Death Artist, my character, Kate McKinnon, is married to a Jewish lawyer. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a mixed marriage between, a, you know, a, a Christian and a Jew. And in fact, um, there's a funeral in there, which is very much a Jewish funeral. So there are things that come into the books, obviously the next book a lot, but um, I just think it's who, how I'm formed and what I think and how I see the world, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, so, so a number of questions uh, have have come in. One of which is, when uh, when did you become a bar mitzvah, and which synagogue on Long Island? Because uh, our very own Linda Groden was the first female, the first bat mitzvah, in 1953 in Franklin Square Jewish Center. Wow. Okay. Well, we weren't far. Um, Jericho Jewish Center. Oh my! Can I do the math? Uh, must have been 1960 or 61. Yeah, yeah, 60, I think. I mean, you know, it's so frightening. How did I get this old? Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's pretty amazing to me. But um, yeah, I'll tell you, that was, I remember my bar mitzvah is so nerve wracking. Do you know? I mean, I, I don't know if, if bar, bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs still learn their prayers from records. But I remember being, you know, playing these 78 RPM records and learning them by rote. And it just was mad. I hope they, no they don't learn them by on records. Although I will tell you in that sort of funny, what's what's old is new again. Um, two of my kids have uh, turntables, you know, it's I, I'll call it the stereo or the hi-fi. But they, they have turntables. They have vinyl. You know, vinyl is the, the cool way to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but but for our kids, they they actually um, they they now get a um, an audio file that has it. But they're still you know to to help as a yeah a, sure. and still as nerve wracking. I mean, I remember from mine. I that's one of the sensations I can remember more than anything is my my knees shaking and knocking together. Um, yeah. And you know, and I certainly I see that and witness that every week. Um, sure. But I also see that as a I think when when I worry if they're not nervous. I mean, it's not about preparation. It is about preparation, but I think when they're nervous, it's because th they get it, um, and it's uh, it's important. It's important to them. It's important to their families. It's a special moment, and you know they may not realize at the time, uh, just as we might not have realized at the time for those of us who became uh, bar and bat mitzvah at the age of thirteen. I know we have many here who became adult b'nai mitzvah. Um, but it is about taking on this this sense of ownership, and I, I think some of our kids get that at thirteen, and some come to it a little bit later on. Yeah, I, I, it's hard for you know. I rem I have so many odd different memories of it, but um, yeah. yeah, you know, I uh, yeah. Someday I should write about that because there's some really funny, crazy parts to that. <laughs> well, uh, we'll look forward to that as well. And we can compare notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, a, a few other questions going back to the book and, and connecting with the story. Uh, why was Picasso a suspect in the theft? Ah, well, Picasso was a real suspect. He was arrested along with his friend Apollinaire, the poet, because Apollinaire and um, Picasso had gotten these little um, sculptures that were stolen and they didn't know that. They had been stolen um, and I think some had been stolen out of the Louvre Museum um, and they bought them, I think innocently, I believe quite innocently, but then they were arrested and they were interrogated and um, 
pollen air was actually put through the ringer and kept overnight and really, and they were eventually let go, but they were prime suspects. It was in all the newspapers. I should say all of the little newspaper clippings in my book are all real clippings. Which reminds me, sorry, that we didn't, I didn't share this. Let me pull this up. I, I know we talked about um, uh, sharing the, some pictures, right? Uh, including the clipping. Let me just, uh, let's see, where's the first one? Here we go. Yes, there we go. So that's from the newspaper. Yeah. And let's see if I can get this a second. Uh, it, is everyone seeing the second picture now? Okay, I just want to make sure sometimes when you share a screen. And the empty wall at the Louvre. Yeah, I'm not seeing them on mine for some reason, but that's okay. Are others seeing it? Did others see it? Well, everyone, everyone's muted. <laughs> okay. Doesn't matter. You know, just the first. Uh, just the oh, first. Okay. Um, maybe the, first. Uh, the rabbi can share them with you another time. I mean, uh, uh, as I said, because my book mixes, there you go. There's the thief. There is Vincenzo Perugia, who becomes Vincent in my book. And I created, I used fact and fiction to create his backstory because you go into the past. The book moves between the past and the present. And I should say that in the past, he is married to Simone, a French woman. And it is the great, one of, to me, one of the few times in my favorite romance I've ever written. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm becoming very romantic in my old age, I think, you know. And there's the, the a photograph of the Louvre with um, the blank wall where the Mona Lisa has hung between a a uh, Titian and a Correggio, and and I forget the numbers, but like hundreds of thousands Pari of Parisians came to see the blank wall, whom had never seen the moment. <laughs> it's just very crazy. So uh, yeah, thank you for showing those. One of the other questions, uh, which I think is related to the book you are working on now, uh, was asking whether you've been in touch with Edmund DeWall, author of Hair and the Amber Eye, uh, and de delved into the Eprusi and Commando family stories who were major Jewish art collectors before World War II. No, I have not. I just finished one book um, of a great grand granddaughter who, who um, has found her great grandfather's collection, Jules Strauss. I don't, uh, I'll show you what I'm, my reading. This is my fun reading. You know. Uh, Some light reading. Yeah, very light reading. But, uh, you know, I read things as I, as I need them. And that's true for the, you know, all of my books. So I'm sure there will be more, um, you know, and, but you know, you do all this research and, Usually it's very little that ends up in the book, just enough, but it's, I need to know what I'm writing about, that's all. So, um, you know, in the last Mona Lisa, I needed to know everything about the Louvre Museum. I needed to know everything about that painting. I read a 700 page book on Leonardo, a great biography, uh, because I, I just wanted to know those things, you know? And so I don't, there is a conversation in the book with two characters when they talk about Leonardo's past. And I used probably two or three facts that I thought people might not know that would be interesting. And, and that's, you know, your research is both great, the greatest thing and it's a trap because you have to be very careful not to use too much because you will put your reader to sleep. And if they want to read a nonfiction book, they will read a nonfiction book. You know, I, I say to people all the time, if they query me about facts, I say, I'm writing a novel, it's a novel. So I take liberties and um, you can't hold me to those facts, you know, because in the last Mona Lisa, and I'm sure this will be true again, when it's a choice between making the story great or using some fact, I will always make my story great. 
<laughs> and then I will tell the reader later in my acknowledgments which books I looked at and that they should read for the facts, you know. So um, it, it reminds me so much of the process of certainly my process for preparing for high holiday sermons. I mean, yeah. I write sermons week in and out, and, and certainly there is research that goes into those. And I too have a, uh, a file that is, you know, I don't know if I call it the sermons I haven't written or I might never write, but there's a lot of material that goes in there, different different topics and, and ideas. But in preparing for high holiday sermons, I do, a, there's a good amount of reading. And right. then there's also that sifting through because yeah, I don't want to put people to sleep either. <laughs> and I have a lot less time to get the point across. Well, you <laughs> have to figure out, you know, in what you're in, let's say the theme of what you're going to talk about, how that research emphasizes or or addresses what the theme you're talking about right mm -hmm. it's what i do as a writer i have to decide you know well was it important that x happened you know during world war ii um, i would never change let's say in the new book i would never change any of those facts and misrepresent them but in my fictional story part of the book the adventure i will take liberties you know that's mm -hmm. all i'm saying I mean, I, I try not to, you know, I have to be careful in that, but um, yeah. So, so sort of connected loosely on, on the art side of things, one of the questions that, that somebody had asked uh, is um, started by saying photographs don't do justice to the colors in a painting. Um, and that you pointed out um, that it isn't illegal to copy a famous painting can people buy at modest prices painted copies of famous paintings to enjoy them in their homes or offices? Where and how and why isn't this commonly done? And then there's a follow-up, which I, I did share with you earlier. Well, let me just say this. You can always buy a reproduction of a painting. You know, that's totally legal. Um, in turn, what I do, I do, you know, that's, I, you know this, I, I do it as a sort of side gig. Uh, periodically, I make copies for people, for collectors. And um, those are kind of a big deal, you know? I mean, I copy paintings exactly, but I'm very, I always let my collectors know, don't try and sell this as the real thing because you're going to get caught. Mm -hmm. I don't paint them as if they're going to be sold as forgeries. You know, if I'm making a painting that was painted in 1950, I don't adhere to colors and pigments and things that were only available in the 50s, so they would be caught. Um, uh, you know, people might make a copy of a painting for you cheaply, Don't not me, but, um, you know, it, it's, if you're making a copy just for yourself or for someone that, and it's private, you can do that. I still have to adhere to the law which is I have to change something about the painting, the size or the materials. I have to get my initials somewhere hidden in the front. I have to sign on the back of the canvas that it is a copy of, so that it cannot be, you know, out, go out into the world as a, as a copy. Um, you know, there's a lot of forgeries of paintings in the world, in museums, all around the world. They find them every day. Uh, and part of the, you know, impetus for the last Mona Lisa is that during the two years it was missing, it is believed that the two men I mentioned in the book, the Marquis de, de, de Fiaro, I can't speak, and Yves Chaudran copied and sold paintings as the original. And that mm -hmm. is pretty much accepted. Um, some historians believe that the real Mona Lisa never made it back to the Louvre. We don't know. Uh, probably it did. But, um, Forgery is unfortunately a big business, as is art theft, um, and uh, very distressing, uh, I think, you know, because art is this beautiful cultural artifact and something that does bring beauty and all sorts of things into our lives. So it's awful when you read about big art thefts when, you know, if you steal a, if you steal a famous painting, you can't sell it because it's so famous. So it's usually bartered as international currency and it's bartered for drugs or arms, all kinds of terrible things. Um, so, uh, you know, I, and it all goes on. There is an mm -hmm. world and an underbelly, a dark underbelly to the art world that is 
awful and really fast. I love right. it. And you, you gave us a taste of that in, in the book too. Um, it, the the follow-up was uh, the fiction uses the device of a discovered painting by a famous artist, which is offered for sale, but the painting turns out to be a forgery so that the sale falls through and the forger is apprehended. And the question was, why don't galleries prominently advertise paintings labeled in the style of so-and-so? Um, such a painting would be beautiful to look at and be affordable for ordinary people who want the painting because it is in the style of an artist whose works they admire. Um, and I noticed there are in the chat a few things that just came through. One is that there are, yes, there are paint by numbers. They also allow at, um, uh, at the National Gallery allows with permission copying by artists. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, for a gallery, it, it um, wouldn't be uh, financially viable to do that. Um, they are, the big museums are now selling NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which you then own a digital file of a painting just for you to be viewed or projected in your home which is quite crazy and they're going to be very expensive. Uh, but a lot of museums are now doing that. So that's a way, I mean, I don't know what they'll cost. I mean, they certainly won't cost what the painting costs. Um, <clears throat> you know, paintings uh, are limited objects and that's why they're expensive. Copies are, as I said, they're not, a, they're not connected to that actual artist or person. So they become of lesser value, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, when I make copies, I really knew how to write that scene in the book with the art forger because I could be inside his head knowing what it's like to make a forgery. You know? So uh, I remember one time I was making a copy of something which I forget, and my daughter, she was about 11 at the time, she was in, came in my studio and she said, Daddy, you, you know, why don't you sell that as the original Picasso or whatever? And my first reaction was because I don't want to go to jail. And then my second reaction was, I think I'm wasting my money on your education. How come you don't know that, you know? So <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, you know, this book deals with forgery, with theft, uh, with all of those things around the art world um, that go on. And I think are really fascinating to know and were the ingredients for a thriller, you know, that was where I was going I, I you know i wanted so many things rabbi i wanted a historical novel a thriller even a romance because as i said before i've never written a romance and i have two romances the one in the past and the one in the present um, and i think they reflect each other you know so and then there was another thing the great luke's um seeking family by trying to understand what happened with his great grandfather was very important to me like trying to find out something about his roots that his family had never talked about which will i think invade my next book so sounds like it um so so curious as well given um uh you know your your new passion when you're not writing or drawing uh little nico <laughs> are you gonna are you going to put a pen or a paintbrush or, or both in his hand eventually? Oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> we'll see what his talents are. Exactly. I thought you were gonna say, Am I going to paint or draw him? Oh yeah, it's only a matter of <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, as I said to my a thought about, you know, children, you have to let them be who they're going to be. So whoever I want I know one thing about my grandson is that unlike myself, you can't tell, I'm only five foot seven. My grandson is going to be very, very tall because my daughter's <laughs> five eight and his father is six foot six. Oh, wow. So I think he's <laughs> a very big boy, you know. Uh, whether he'll be an artist, I don't know. He'll do what he needs to do in the world, right? Exactly, exactly. And I know that will be wonderful to watch unfold. Yeah, yeah. Um, th those pages, those are the most precious. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I, I think that we've covered all the questions that people had sent to me either ahead of time or, or in the chat. Um, I believe, let me just double check that. Oh, the last, last question. Are the initials really on the fakes? Uh, I, I know that the, the idea of forgery and is so fascinating 
Um, and you know, the fact that whether in a museum or in someone's home, whether or not something is the real thing. Uh, well, I'm not going to answer that question. Here's what I'm going to say. Whoever asked that question in my book is my website, www.jonathansantlofer.com. You can ask me any question you want. My tech guy forwards every question that comes in and I answer most of them. So if you want an answer to that question, I will tell you, but I'm not going to tell everyone because if they haven't read the book, I don't want to ruin the book for them. And, um, I get a lot of questions through my website, you know, so uh, feel free to continue to ask your questions and I'll do my best to answer them, um, you know, there uh, about. And, and the link is uh, in the chat and, um, and I can put one more time, just give me a moment. Uh, I can put a link to the, um, the book one more time. I will say I, I, and not for me, although it is for me, but um, in my way to thank the Jewish Book Council and Rabbi Shankman and individual congregations, I encourage you to buy the book through whatever bookstore organization your organization supports or an independent bookstore. These are very important to our culture. Um, and, you know, I think and you know, I, I worry about the future of the book. And so I encourage people to, and you know, there's just nothing like it. I mean, I spent a lot of time in libraries as a boy and I buy a lot of books. Um, it's nothing like, you know, going into another world with a book. It's really quite- So cool. true, so true. And, um, and as mentioned, I know we have our, our mitzvah mall link, which then goes back and gives us the opportunity to support important um, causes in the community, our local, Bookstore Politics and Prose is one who often, when we're in person, uh, helps us with the books. But you know, in, I invite you as well to visit a, a bookstore. As I highlighted earlier, my cousin Deborah, who's on here but lives in New Jersey, is uh, in 2022 uh, pursuing 22 bookstores at least <laughs> to visit. Um, and there is nothing, as you you know from seeing behind me, this is my my home library, which I, I there, there's nothing like holding the books in your hand. And actually one of the um, one of the really wonderful things we just introduced our youngest to, I, she'd been there when she was little, but she didn't remember. She had a pile of books that were, you know, really, it, I was fine. I, I'm sort of, they have to run the books through me, whether or not they're being donated or kept in the, in the house, in the collection. Um, but these were books that could go back. So we take them to the friends of the library. And she discovered that not only can you donate books to the friends of the library, but then you can purchase books <laughs> for the friends of the library store, supporting yeah. our libraries and uh, and supporting books. And it really is such a, a wonderful, um, I, I don't know how we would have, uh, I, I find that books are such a wonderful, not just escape, but opportunity for us to travel together as we have throughout this pandemic. Um, to learn together and uh, and really to to yeah to enjoy these unique perspectives on the world. I, I'll say quickly two things. I'm pretty sure I've read at politics and prose in the past for our earlier books. The other thing is, uh, if the rabbi is if the, if a lot of you buy the book, I can send book plates with my signature to you, Rabbi. If you know you know how many people there are who bought the book, and I will sign them, and then you can distribute them somehow or people can get them. We can certainly do that. I will love, I will welcome the opportunity to distribute them and see people in person or have you pick them up. But that would be wonderful, Jonathan. I'll, I'm happy to, Just to be know. in touch about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for being with us today. Uh, you know, I, I have to tell you the sun just came out. I don't know about other people's windows, but outside my window, all of a sudden these rays of light came through. Thank you for bringing us some sunshine on this rainy, cold day, and uh, and certainly for for uh, giving us this wonderful lead into Shabbat, just a, a chance to take that deep breath and escape from from the everyday and uh, and explore new worlds and, and known worlds. And uh, I know we're excited to continue to uh, to read your writing. Uh, certainly, maybe next time to see some art on the wall. But that's no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have walls in my house that I, I have not, you know, we've been in our house for 10 years and, and there are still things that have not gone up. 
Um, and uh, and really just the, this wonderful conversation and opportunity. So, so delighted and great. thank you for being with us. It was wonderful to talk to. I'm sorry I'm not closer and I can't come and hear you and you know, talk to the congregation. This was wonderful. I'm sure you're absolutely wonderful rabbi, I can tell. Thank you. <laughs> and this is being recorded. So thank you. And my mom is on, which is uh, makes it even better. So yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. We're so, so happy to have you with us. I'm going to um, thank you. You don't, you can, you can stick around for a few minutes to hear what's upcoming. I'm going to, uh, to bring in Jeff Bergman, as we um, as we thank again Jonathan Sandlover for for certainly for your time today, but for your your writing, and we um, we're excited to continue to read you to read your words and and to have you come back and be with us again. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I, I want to thank publicly um, Jeff and and Ruth for all of their work uh, in coordinating these and um, and. The empty nesters committee for all that they're doing it to especially as we come back together uh we hope that you'll you'll come and find lots of different opportunities to be with us in person soon